All right, so it's a great pleasure of mine to introduce um, a good friend of mine, um, Adi Rosenberg uh, from AvaLinks. He's been an active uh, participant in the uh, wrist activity group within the Video Services Forum and is going to be talking about something that isn't 100% focused on wrist, which is cool. Adi's going to be talking about troubleshooting IP delivery network and the related problems that you might have in an IP delivery network. So take it away, Adi. Thank you, Wes. To those who don't know me, I'm Adi Rosenberg. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Alvalinks. And today I'm going to talk about uh, something that here at the show, everybody sees as an obvious thing, but nobody knows exactly what does it do. And let me ask, start with a question. Who is using IP today? 50% of the audience is using IP. Another one joined, he's also using IP. Do you know what does, does that do and what happens when it fails? <laughs> Nobody. So I'm, try, I'm going to try to show you from my experience what you need to understand and let's see how it goes. So first of all, introductions about, introduction about Alvalink. Alvalink was founded by broadcast and networking veterans to bring innovation. That is why we have Alva in our name. Alvalink is focused to, to on simplifying the road to the cloud and in the cloud by way of delivery protocols supported by AI toolset. We are a VSF member and I'm a big participant on a weekly basis in the RIST activity group and also in the RIST forum. So let's start with the question mark. Understanding what is going on with my network and what in my stream going over that network. Why good transport is so important for me and my customers? Why should I care? What do I need to know in advance and while running the service? Because sometimes all I have is that service is there, service is not. Let's see what I need. So what do I need to do? How do I achieve that knowledge and information? My presentation will address all of these problems head on. So why transport is so important? Let's go to the past. In the past, when we wanted to transport goods from one place to the other, going back thousands of years, we used landmarks. We will say, I need to reach I'm in Africa, I need to reach Asia, follow the sea, shorelines. Afterwards, oh, it runs faster than I expected. Going back, let's hold. Afterwards, innovation came and they said, let's give you guidance. The Viking used following the North Star. Following the North Star made them uh, use seas for transporting goods and also raiding some villages along the way so they can get those goods for, for usage. If we wanted to travel over a uh, night by sea and we had stormy weather, we needed to have lighthouses to give us advice what to do and how not to break down in the middle. Then some crazy guy invented maps and compasses so that we now use a map and a compass to find our way so that we can transport our goods to the destination, but we never know, knew how much will it take us to do that. Nowadays, nobody is transporting anything without something called a GPS. You want it to go from, from one place to the other, you go to your car, your phone, and you use the GPS to do that. So now transport can be done much more controllably, controllably and on time. And we as an industry are now trying to get to the cloud, but we don't have any maps. We don't have any compasses. We don't have any assistance while doing so. All we know is that, hey, we buy a service or somebody has a service, we need to get there. How do we get that assistance, that guidance to reach the cloud or in the cloud in this new era that everybody in this show are talking about. So let's understand what is the difference 
So let's compare internet versus fiber. So fiber is similar to a train. It has tracks. It's your track. You put the train on. Nobody else is using that at the same time. And you have a peace of mind that you will get to your destination on time. Unless the crazy drivers try to cross, you are sure to be delivered on time. So it's a reliable single track, peace of mind. The internet is a possibility, endless possibilities. I have a car, I have roads, I can take whatever I do. Yesterday I, at night I, was, I stumbled into Amsterdam. I needed to get out. The GPS gave me hundreds of possibilities to take. And believe me, it was a nightmare to get out of Amsterdam yesterday at night. So I have possibility, I have the freedom. I have multiple choices. That's what the internet gives me and then the cloud itself. So my hope is that I will have freeways, empty freeways early in the morning. But in fact, I get crowd, I get congestion and only maybe the other side is working for me. So this is the difference between fiber and the internet when we use that and we need to know that information. Because for us as video guys, we need to deliver a service on time and overcome problems that are happening with the, the, the one thing that we don't know, which is the IP network. We are using that, we've been using that for the last 15 years, but still it's a beast that we could not tame or control. We are making steps, we are making provisions, whether it's on the compressed world, going to higher bit rates makes it much more unmanageable and we need to invest a lot of money to have private lines in order to achieve that or have to, if you want to deliver 2110 to the cloud it costs us a lot of money and we need to have more information to make a better use of that so why should i care so ip-based trans transport is becoming the new backbone of our industry we have RIST, SRT, NDI, JPEG access, 2110 protocol, fueling new applications. Just go to hole one, two, five, and seven, you will see everybody are talking about that, everybody. But if you ask them what exactly, how they do that, they don't know, it's a magical thing. If you want answers, they tell you, go to AWS, go to Google, go to Azure, they will tell you what they are doing. But Keep in mind, guys, we are coming from an industry that control and visibility are the staples of our industry. We cannot allow somebody else to take charge. We need to have some visibility over that. So networks are complex living organisms that are dynamic and have unpredictable behavior and performance. And that is the challenge that we need to overcome. Control of visibility at the cloud era is yet another challenge that we need to overcome. It is increasing dramatically with scale. Sites are coming in, users, more and more users are going to the cloud. What that means to you, it means that congestion, crowds, somebody needs to do the job and you need to know what is going on. And if your service is not running, what do you need to do to avert that? That is the control and visibility that is important. And as, as we will go in more and more to the cloud and become a real production environment, it will become more and more necessary to monitor and uh, uh, have control over that. So what is so different these days? So some history, I'm a, hist I'm a, I'm a geek of history. Remember the good old days, we had ASI, a connection. It was simple, it was point to point. It hardly failed. Maybe once a year, if some, if some technician just pulled it, pulled it out. Satellite gave us assured delivery and distribution. Fiber was private. Nowadays, we are a part of a growing community. Just imagine if all those companies out there put their stuff on the network fiber, internet, whatever, the amount of traffic they will generate at once in parallel, the congestion and 
we will need to know who will cross before which service. Also, other departments in your organization have businesses in the cloud, whether they're doing production, storage, SaaS, and so on. So they also need to get to the cloud and not, and they are basically using the same bandwidth that you are using for your video service. And, of course, other organizations may do the same thing. And as I said, over time, it will become crowded. But hey, there's this, there's guys, these are guys, they're called IT, IT guys, DevOps, and they take care of things. No? So let's ask yourself. I'm starting a service. Did the IT get the email on time? Did they open the ports, the necessary ports to make it happen? In my organization or in the cloud? And I will, and guys, without blaming the IT guys, eight times out of 10, they did not open the e email and they probably decided to open a different port and they forgot to send you a follow-up email to tell you, hey, use this port instead. Did they set up the QoS correctly? Did they secure the right SLA for the service that you need? And do you have the right bandwidth to make it happen? And then the devil's guys, did they took care of the cloud ingest, which basically they have to repeat all the things that the local IT people needed to do. If the answer is no, you may be in trouble. So isn't reliable streaming enough? I'm a big supporter of RIST, SRT, and DI, and they do have means to do error recovery and jitter recovery. But, and they have shared tasks, is reliable delivery, secure delivery, on-time output after the jittering. But they are based on the basic assumption that the network is there. If the network is misbehaving, nothing will make it happen. So it is your task to guarantee that this is all the time. This is all the time. So what do I need to know in advance? Let's start with the easy stuff, connectivity. Can I reach my destination, whether it's a cloud or non-cloud? Do I have the correct open ports? If, the, if not, then nothing will work, regardless of the protocol, whatever you want to do. My available network path, if I'm using one path or two paths, if I'm using uh, seamless switching, I will have more than one path. Then I need to check RTT, the number of hops, time for every hop. I need to, to, to do MTU limits, packet loss, jitter, and this is like a short list of basic things that you need to do. There is more and more than that. I need to check my upload and download speed, which is the maximum bitrate, with errors, without errors. Some, if I have a SRT recent DI, I can tolerate some packet loss, but with 2110, forget about it. If you have, you have 2110, you have packet loss and a higher latency than needed, it won't work. And I also need to identify abnormal artifacts. For example, other flows, Timing, time based interferences of others using the network that interfere with my service. And basically, it is network, be network behavior as a whole. I need to be aware of what is happening. And I talked about it in previous presentation showing up what is happening when the network bursts or un does not burst, and how does that affect my streaming. So, what do I need to, to do while streaming? So, the first thing is to remember that. You are not alone. You need to identify whatever may cause your stream to slow down or break down. And those can be RTT increase, which will may impact your buffering and packet loss recovery. Number of hops increase or decrease will point out to changes in the routing. So the routing might change and that can affect your streaming. Jitter increased might also affect your streaming while you are doing so. And if your jitter buffer is not tolerant enough, 
your service will break down. Packet loss increase. We need to know what is happening, whether it is known or unknown environment and whether I can tolerate that. Additional flows, sudden flows that go in from my source to, and then to the destination, can they cause damage to my service? If I'm running 2110 and somebody else is hogging the bandwidth, the 2110 service will not work. Similar switching delay. I need to see that it is still correlated to the my, correlation, my se initial settings. So now let's talk, what do I need to keep track of? Basic things that standard IT people know. A simple thing is to track the number of hops, to detect network routing changes as they happen. And if you're doing over the internet or more specifically in the cloud, the number of hops may change dynamically. And you, don't, you have no control over that, but you should be aware of that. RTT changes, you detect the delay that may impact jitter events, ARQ recovery, and 7022.7 similar switching delay. Number of packets in a window of time to see whether it's increasing or decreasing and what is the behavior of that. The packet loss behavior, is it a random salt and pepper or is it a burst? Salt and pepper is easy to maintain, burst, not that easy. Jitter increases, watch out for impact on packet loss. Multiple retries, reverse link issues or increase on packet loss can also impact your service. Link bandwidth changes can cause excessive loss because of bandwidth changes and you may need to change your routing or add adaptivity to your service with any known protocol that can support that. Other flows on your links, you need to see if somebody else is hogging some of the bandwidth that you're supposed to use and he is a, he's a pirate hogging some of your bandwidth. So let's now talk about some basic tools, open source tools that are available in my bag of tricks in order to identify the problem. These are standard tools that I just put in here to let you know that you can go to your IT people and they will gladly help you to set those up. I will start with the basic tool called Nmap. Every IT person knows Nmap because that is the basic tool for cybersecurity that he needs to run a scan to see what ports are open in his network or the destination network, whether those are UDP or TCP ports. So that gives you vital information. A basic ping test. I'm not a big fan of a ping, but the ping does give me basic information about RTT. It gives me sample packet loss. It's a poor result, but still it's a piece of information that I can use. The next tool is trace route or trace path that are based on ping. The, you basically can get the number of hops from the source to the destination. The RTT for every, every endpoint, every endpoint in the route, how is that? Uh, and you can use that information and monitor that so that if that changes, that will impact my service. The next tool is called iPerf. You can test with it. Load speed, maximum bandwidth, packet loss, and jitter. It's free tool. You can use that to test the link, whether it's based on UDP or TCP. I will always recommend for the broadcast industry to use UDP-based testing and not TCP because almost nobody is using TCP nowadays. The next is a TCP dump. To those who are familiar with Wireshark, it's a basically packet capture. You can capture a load of packets and analyze them and you can detect your stream, other streams, other traffic. It's a very important investigation tool that you can use. The next tool in the list is VNStat. It's a very simple reporting tool about your RX and TX bandwidth and packet rate. So you can, and you can run live so you can see the usage of that bandwidth and the link that you are using. There are protocol specific reports of bandwidth, packet loss, and packet rate. You can look for the presentation I gave at the previous IP showcase about RIST adding that capability and ample of information. 
that will make your life easier with the reports that the RIST is providing to you. How do I isolate and avert it? So the first thing that you need to do in order to avert is trust and verify. Trust and verify everything before you start any live streaming. Don't trust the figures that somebody promised you, oh, I have 80 megabits. You paid for 80 megabits and you think that it is there. Believe me, from, pre from my experience, four times out of 10, you pay for 80, you get 20. Why? Nobody thinks you're, you are serious enough. And when you start to push your 60 megabit stream over the 20, it takes you time to understand that in fact, they only set you up with 20 megabits. Believe me. Use more than one link. The RIST, SRT, and hopefully NDI, and other proprietary protocols do allow to support of 70.2022.7 seamless switching. You can do two paths, three paths or more. So now if something goes down, you have an assured recovery, seamless recovery. So that is important. Have a backup plan. Monitor the stream behavior all the time, if you can. Watch the packet loss, whether it's spread or burst. Check down recovered events correlate them to other events that in the system. Watch out for jitter increases. Look for RTT reports. And look for unknown flows because those are bandwidth hogs and you don't want them to go along with you. You paid for the SLA, not them. Test the link bandwidth from time to time to see that it's still, that 80 megabits is still there and it hasn't dropped to 67 or 64 and you're trying to push 60, or maybe it will drop to 57, and you're trying to recover. And my best recommendation is, don't allow your connection to go wild on you. Thank you very much. I hope uh, you learned something. Any questions? Thank you, Adi. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, the, the gentleman in the front. You showed a whole bunch of uh, public domain tools that uh, they do one thing. Uh, in fact, TC, TCP dump, you, you get it and you have to look at it. You have to know what you're, going, what you're looking for. Um, I purpose, yeah, you test the link. Is there any, any more comprehensive set of tools or anything that makes it easy to, to run? Uh, the there are IT tools, IT, IP, IT related solutions that try to give you more in-depth information about the availability of the network, the users of the network, the behavior of uh, components under their control. Some of those tools are open source. Some of them are service related or SaaS environment. I can tell you that we at AlvaLinks identify this as an opportunity that we are going to go for and provide the, the tools necessary to visualize and simplify the information for that purpose. We hadn't encountered yet with a tool for the broadcast industry that does that. Hence, we are uh, chasing this opportunity. Um, building a tool like that actually for somebody with the right combination of skills wouldn't be a big challenge, but the kind of person you need uh, needs to have a lot of experience, but not just broadcast, but also IT, programming networks down to the packet level and understanding all of that. Those kind of people are very rare, but if you can find them, they're over 50, and the industry doesn't want to employ them. How do we get older people back in the industry? Well. You're looking at a bunch of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Present uh, company included, right? Yes. <laughs> um, well, bringing the people back is a challenge. Um, right now, what we see is that I'm in front, uh, basically heading one of these groups of people coming back and bringing that capability 
I have that knowledge. I have that experience. I've been in the industry for 25 years. I have done broadcast and networking, and I have people that are doing both, and we are consolidating that. You are right, and I've been talking about that many times, about people leaving the industry, knowledge gone, and people think that everything is IT. And we need to start to use resources that will train, educate people about what is video. Video is not a commodity like some people think. It's something that, it's very dear to my heart, video. Uh, 2110 that we can deliver pixels is an amazing feat of engineering that people don't understand. The, it's like sending a man to the moon. For me, it's sending a man to the moon. And doing that correctly, continuously, all the time, is a great challenge, and we need to have the tools to do that. I see a great void of the young folks uh, uh, taking the time to learn what is a video and what is the root of video and why did we go and did those decisions about the amount of pixel, uh, bits per pixels, what the difference between 8 bits, 10 bits, and maybe 12 bits, the Luma and Chroma delay, audio and uh, video and audio synchronization, that is something that is lost. But here, for me, I'm trying to tackle the thing that nobody talks about is that the networking side of things. That is the, the point that I'm trying to convey. I, I can't solve the education challenge. We have West with us that is doing a pretty good job to educating people. Uh, and we need people, organization to take that seriously. Uh, people think that video are just taking an uh, OBS encoder. They're already doing the encoding for me. I don't understand what is a VBV buffer and how does that improve my service. I don't understand what is the difference between 8-bit and 10-bits. All I care about is can I capture my HDMI? Uh, what's the difference between the camera in my laptop or a Sony NX series uh, mirrorless camera and how does that improve the video and the uh, customer viewership satisfaction. We need to bring that back. But unfortunately, people see the industry as um, a good enough thing. A lot, of, um, a lot of video today, is the quality is like, for me, I call it a good enough. It's not, I, I can have a long chat about the yeah. good enough approach. And I blame the Gulf Wars for that. The first time we saw pictures from the battle, green 128 by 128 picture, it was amazing, it was live in 1991. That was the point where video went down the, the road <laughs> for me. Okay. So any other questions? Yeah. Very last question, time is up. Last slide, Adi. Um, I see on the right, thank you. And on the left side, I see a guy, girl, riding a, a wave with lots of money and gold. How, how does this relate to the cloud issues? You ride the cloud and you generate a lot of money. In order to do that, you need to make sure that you, are, you have a solid surfboard to surf. You surf the internet and you have enough money and funding to do that. Uh, enough money to go where the waves are. Okay. Adi, thank you very much. And um, if somebody has some more questions, they can get a hold of you.